Well, thank you for letting me speak to you today. I'm uh, going to go through a, a use case of how, uh, how Marist College in particular has been using predictive analytics. Uh, I joined the school in 2015, so just to give you a little bit of background on the learning analytics, uh, the Open Analytics uh, grant that was originally funded this process for, uh, for this institution was in 2011. Uh, and that was a grant by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's where this, this learning analytics processor actually began. The interesting thing that we're going to discuss is, you know, what's, what's the need? You know, what's the use case? Why, why learning analytics? Does it have value? Um, is there evidence uh, that would support that? Um, what was some of the operational feedback? What did the pilots ex uh, expose? Um, and, and how do we apply the predictions? Who's going to use them? Uh, and then where does that where does that lead us for XAPI? What what processes? What uh, patterns do we need to implement so that we can use that in, in an XAPI environment? So uh, some interesting statistics. Uh, this is current as of 2017. Uh, now we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but basically our predictions are on a course by course basis the statistics we're looking at here are completion rates in institutions so there will be a, a translation between the two but basically um, you know 16 uh, six-year outcomes are are not that fantastic and then if you break it down by different ethnicities uh, you can see how the how the numbers change significantly um, and this is just four-year institutions you'll see different statistics in two-year institutions and private versus public uh, so that so there's a, a general mix but I wanted to give just a, a general overview of, of what the, the numbers are are looking mm -hmm. like um, and then uh, Michigan State's done some some really good work in learning analytics and early intervention. So the idea of predictive analytics and catching a student early on where you can do the most good, whether it be a strategic withdrawal from a class or just a, uh, simply a, a little push to get them moving along early enough before they get into academic trouble. And uh, especially students that are receiving grants, uh, as soon as they find themselves in academic probation, uh, basically, they'll lose their grant money, so they're, they're less likely to continue on. So early interventions definitely uh, have an effect uh, and the ability to intervene early. Like, for instance, we're going to go through some of our data in a minute. Um, we start predicting in and around week five uh, in a 15 week course. So about a third of the way into the course, uh, you can start getting a good feel for uh, how well that student's going to do based on certain predictors that might be fed in. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get into the slides going through. So um, what I wanted to do was introduce some feedback from, uh, from faculty. We'll certainly start with the positive feedback. Uh, it, what we're finding with, with the use of predictive analytics is a mixed bag. And a lot of it has to do with how well or how frequently they're using the LMS. Um, for instance, if you're in an on-the-ground class uh, and you're not online and your institution does not uh, really enforce the LMS activity, then you're less likely to get some of the uh, some performance out of your better performance out of your model. Let's put it that way. Um, so the other thing that came out, and this is one of our professors saying he's looking at the analytics, looking at the predictions, and then discovering interesting things about a student that he might not know. So this is certainly one aspect and, and one set of feedback, and this is fairly consistent across uh, professors that have embraced the use of learning analytics in their, in their uh, evaluation of their students. And then, of course, there's the other side of this, which is if I'm doing predictive analytics, what are my predictors? And if I'm using predictors that uh, potentially introduce bias, uh, am I going to get resistance from faculty or am I going to get resistance from instructors? And the, the clear answer is yes, you will. 
uh, and this is some of that anecdotal evidence that um, some professors just simply do not believe that we should be using certain pieces of data. And there's a much longer discussion to be had about uh, what inputs to the model is going to mean. Will, will it be biased? How do you create or how do you create a scenario where it's not biased? So um, you know, I'd be happy to talk about that or answer questions about that. So moving into sort of the, the next you know, next phase of of what we've done, we have an enterprise implementation now here at Marist, which was a full production uh, release of the predictive analytics and then what those actually look like. So uh, when a professor uh, or an instructor is looking at uh, a dashboard, they're looking at activity for students, which all of this data is used to generate uh, the actual prediction or at risk for, for that particular student. Uh, in this chart that we're looking at right now, uh, I was a snapshot taken on week 10. So we would have been predicting for, for five weeks at this point. But the reality is, if you're a student, um, well, for instance, here at this institution, uh, you can withdraw without academic penalty right up until about, well, I think we're at it right now, so week seven. And the predictive analytics starting at week five, it gives you about a two week range to, to make a decision in a, in a course. So that's where faculty interventions and student learning centers and all of those types of uh, student support uh, processes could kick in and either help that student to achieve success in that course or uh, recommend a withdrawal from the course before academic penalty. Maybe they're overloaded, maybe they have some kind of situation that's affecting them, but, but that early intervention uh, starting around week five through week seven is, is really a benefit to the student. So uh, the next chart I brought up is in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a donut chart, which is a distribution of the grades, uh, final grades compared to what our predictions look like. So, I mean, we could, we could spend a, a bit of time on this uh, bubble chart, which is really placing the, the students on the chart at, at the week six uh, prediction. And you'll see a lot of different, um, different situations where, like in the upper right hand corner, we have a student that was a green bubble at week six, but wound up with a D in the course. So we don't really know what that causality was. And the same thing goes for other students that may be in, in yellow that may have an A in the course uh, when all was said and done. So that's the next generation of, of predictive analytics will be the prescriptive analytics piece of it, which is to evaluate how performant the models were where they got it right, where they got it wrong. Um, why did that happen? Uh, was it because we had a lack of data? Was it because there was not a whole lot of LMS activity? Um, there's other scenarios that we're aware of where, for example, um, a student might have a lot of LMS activity, but that activity doesn't necessarily translate into effort. Uh, you'll see this in courses that aren't organized very well, where the content is scattered about so that a student is, is having a hard time locating information. So they'll have a lot of LMS activity, but still not doing well in the course. So uh, the, the graphs and charts and the, the analytics that come out of it uh, help you get a better picture of what's going on with the class. So. Um, Moving on to the next chart, what we're looking at here is this is a course that would have been in progress um, and everybody's in a black circle. And for, for this, each one of the bubbles has a black circle around it, in other words. And in that case, we don't have sufficient information to generate an accurate prediction. And accuracy is a bad word to use. Maybe uh, uh, 
not in a position to produce a prediction that is uh, well performing. And the example I like to use is here at Marist College, four to six percent of our student population is at risk at any one point in time for in any one particular class. So if I produced a predictive model that always said they were never at risk, it would be accurate 94% um, of the time. So that doesn't really serve much, much value. So really, when we're doing the analytics, if we don't have sufficient data, we produce what's called a static prediction, just so we can put all students on the on the chart, which is based on previous performance. So their GPA, their SAT scores, uh, any grades they might received in the past. And then long about week five, when LMS activity gets to the point where it's, it's usable and can produce uh, good input to the predictive engine, black circles go away and we start generating real predictions. So Ed, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So under the hood, how do you justify when you like uh, um, adjust your modeling and uh, put more or less variable into your modeling? How do you justify which is is toward better? Well, um, you can look at the rock curves uh, to really try to understand that. Certainly, when you're training the model. Um, you're, you're going to sort of decide what the, the, the best model given a set of data is going to be. So we'll be, we use the confusion matrix during the training process to really understand what, what's starting to, to work best. But the reality is once you get into you know, the normal flow of the course, we have three different models that actually run uh, depending on what data is inbound. So we set, we have separate models based on what we consider to be core data elements. For, for example, if the student doesn't have a GPA at all, um, mm -hmm. that's a very good predictor. So a model with a GPA included as part of it just isn't, isn't going to perform very well. So we have a separate model that, that handles those scenarios. Um, uh, if there's no grade book usage, which happens frequently where a, a professor is using an LMS, but they're not using the grade book portion of it. So you don't have any partial contributions to their final grades. There's no quiz grades, no assignment grades. So in that case, uh, there would be a different model for that, which would concentrate more on activity and, and previous academic performance. So basically at runtime, um, we're checking the, we, when we generate the unit of analysis, we decide which model to send that unit of analysis to, to generate the prediction based on what is and is not present. Uh, yeah, and how do you justify, for example, you will have like a ABC three models and how do you justify which one is better? It, it's really, when you say justify, do you mean how do we make the decision or how did we decide up front? Yeah, how do you compare different models? Um, when you train the models is when that all, all of that happens. So during, at the end of every semester mm -hmm. um, is when we do all the model tuning and training. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so before we even move things to the production where or to the point where you're basing the unit of analysis on what data is available we've already made the determination what's going to be best performing and our training sets are basically two years back so from current semester back two years to maintain context because your your student body will change you know a high school student today and it and uh, when they become a, a freshman in college, their profile is going to be different. So we retrain at the beginning of every semester. Okay, thank you. Yep. Were there any other questions about that? So uh, 
moving along a little bit, just just more dashboard, uh, you know, aggregated activity that we're looking at right here, um, so that you can tell uh, basically the way the models behave is it's it's a comparison on a course by course basis of that student against everybody else in the class. So it's it's not you know straight up numbers. It's it's using data that is comparative in nature, and that's what gets fed into the model, and that that will help. Uh, level out spikes that you might see uh, where one class might be doing better than another, just in general, depending on the on the teaching style, the professor, the strength of material, that kind of thing. So building the case for XAPI, um, full disclosure, uh, right here at Marist, we currently are not we don't have an LRS implemented, but we just started to implement one. So we're embracing the whole XAPI uh, environment now. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the sources for the data uh, that are used in the predictive analytics engines is the learning management system itself, the student information system, um, social media in the sense that we can get whatever is available here on campus. We don't go out to like Twitter or Facebook or anything like that, because that's another whole political quagmire on trying to to create profile information on on a student. And I would imagine, Mitch, you're, you, as you were talking about AI and and how students or uh, how individuals are worried about their job being replaced, now we have this whole privacy issue on on social media and trying to determine student behavior. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some some of the other data, you know, as far as what's next, uh, we've we've postulated that gee, it would be interesting to know when they're swiping in and out of their dorms. It would be interesting to know uh, are they eating? Uh, you know, what's their nutritional habits? Uh, all all of that contributes to education. Can we get that data? Technically, absolutely. Will we? Absolutely not. Um, that's that's a uh, that's the, one of the issues with with building these predictive models is talking to the data custodians and making sure that you're, you're able to get the data both from an ethical standpoint and, and from a political standpoint as far as the institution is concerned. Um, right now we run a data warehouse. We don't, we don't have an LRS implementation, but as I said, we're moving away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll still maintain a warehouse, but we think uh, XAPI and LRS implementations are going to work much better moving into uh, uh, our next generation models. And then one of the bigger points that I would stress through, throughout the whole presentation is that when you train your models, the, train, the model has to be trained based on the data at your institution. Mm -hmm. we, we've found that although you can you can create a general performing model that may perform across institutions, but the institution itself is going to have distinctly different profiles. They're going to have different rates of academic probation. They're going to have different student body sizes, different student makeups. So mm -hmm. it's, it's imperative that you not try to create a generic model that you think will perform across institutions because in general what we've discovered is that it it will perform to a certain extent but it's not going to achieve the level of prediction that i i think you would be interested in or something that's that's performing in a in a way that's meaningful so um, is this general i mean uh, not only in this kind of prediction also in like adaptive learning this kind of prediction should be trained um, depend on when we change the body, we, we should retrain the algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh. it, it's you, because institutions are so different. Yeah, you, you can't uh, expect the performance of the models to be the same across institutions. We have speculated that if a profile of an institution is similar enough to another profile of an institution, then maybe they would perform. But we're, mm -hmm. we haven't been able to, well, I, I shouldn't say we haven't been able to, we have not uh, made the effort yet to mm -hmm. sort of prove that out. Uh, and then the other, the other issue about the models that we run and that the use case for us is uh, the, everything is course specific. 
you're really interested in predicting on a course by course basis. We're we're not interested at this point in re well, I shouldn't say we're not interested in uh, we're we're not predicting for retention. We're mm -hmm. predicting for success in a course. Mm. Um, and then this is some of the activity data that we use. Uh, as, as I said earlier in the discussion, uh, activity does not necessarily mean effort. So uh, when we look at the, the type of data that you're pulling in, understanding that when you pull that activity in and how you feed that into your model and what your unit of analysis looks like and how heavily you weight that activity uh, is definitely a consideration as, as you're building things out. And then moving on to XAPI statements, I mean, that's one of the purposes of the subcommittee that, that, uh, that Jesse, you and I are on with, with John mm -hmm. and others. Um, what are those statements going to look like? Uh, you know, where does the ETL happen? Um, how do you aggregate uh, the data in order to get it into a statement that can then be fed into a model? And, and how, how do those interfaces work? And then when the predictions come back out again, what do those statements look like? How do you, how do you get it back into, um, into the learning record store so that it has meaning and can be used in the future? Um, so just to sort of tie things up, uh, what we're discovering with the predictive engines is that uh, professors and instructors are using the predictions to augment what they already know about their students. And that is one of the sort of the hurdles that, that we have when you start introducing these predictive models is you will have professors and, and instructors that will say, I know my students very well. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't need to tell me that they're going to do poorly. I already know they're doing poorly um, or that they're going to do well. I already know they're doing well. Uh, what we're discovering is in one of the quotes earlier was that you know that for most of your students, but you may find that there's a couple of students you didn't know that about, mm -hmm. whether they're doing well or poorly. And here's this little piece of data that might want you to take a little closer look. So getting away from the idea that you're going to use this as, as a tool by itself to identify risk, you're using it as a tool to augment the professor's uh, view of their student. And then from that point, they can uh, develop intervention strategies. And one of the things that we currently do not do but can do is provide the prediction to the student. Mm. Because, because it's difficult, and this is one of the difficulties of explaining to the professors as well, is that you're predicting the future here. There will be false positives. There will be false negatives. Mm. Uh, and that is something that needs to be understood uh, as part of the presentation. When they see, for example, when I was showing the bubble chart earlier, uh, we saw the red, yellow, green. Well, yellow means that we don't know. Yellow does not mean they might be at risk. It was indeterminate. And trying to explain that difference uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. So, um, and then going into the future, what are the, the future models going to be? Well, we're, we're looking at... Um, you know, some, some AI and some deep learning and uh, maybe natural language processing, trying to understand how well somebody's forum post is written, perhaps. Um, and then moving into prescriptive models. Once we've done predictions on those students in the past, can we take those predictions and feed them forward into future predictions? And can we take uh, the interventions that have occurred and then make recommendations as to what might be able to be done um, to improve that student's chance of success. And um, that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. So, any questions for Ed? I saw um, Dr. Sharma, do you have question for Ed? Hello, Jesse. Hey, hello, Dr. Sharma. 
no i actually i like this presentation very much uh so thanks to edward and uh, uh, you for making uh, uh, getting this presentation done uh at present no question but uh, maybe i have got some idea from this presentation so uh, let's see in future mm -hmm. would you like to introduce yourself uh oh yes i think okay uh i am uh currently working with ambedkar university which is a public university in new delhi uh as professor of instructional design and prior to that uh, i was with open university in malaysia and uh, for around two decades i have been a regional director with indira gandhi national open university which is uh, in a way one of the largest open universities in the world and uh, for a long time i have been working in uh, uh, online learning and uh, various lms particularly of late uh, i'm working on moodle and in this university also in fact uh, uh, as jesse knows about it when i was in penang malaysia i started uh, uh, working taking a small project using x api and i hope my team there uh, since i have returned back to new delhi uh, they may be doing it and uh, now in this uh, university in new delhi we are upgrading our moodle to 3.5 uh, which is the uh, latest stable version and uh, we are uh, now in the means uh, i have asked my colleagues to get some lrs so that we can capture uh, some behavioral data of our students so in that sense uh, means uh, uh, i see that this presentation by edward is uh, very beneficial to us mm -hmm. yeah looking forward to have more collaboration in this community with you yes thank you so much Thank you. Hi, I had a question. Um, yeah. I can, yeah. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Um, so uh, I wonder if, uh, just getting Edward's advice on this, we, we're at, so I'm at the uh, University of British Columbia, which is a large institution um, in the, on the West Coast. Um, mm -hmm. We currently use an LMS, uh, Canvas, um, and we, we have very small scale usage of XAPI and, and an LRS, but it's really, we're, we're stuck in this. Um, first of all, we have a, a learning analytics um, ethics policy review. And so the privacy issues and, and ethics of who should uh, view the data, who should access the data, we're, we're sort of tied up in, in that sort of um, uh, policy um, issues um, and legal issues around it. So we're sort of stuck in that space. So, uh, but eventually, um, you know, we have a very large learning technology ecosystem, but we really don't have the infrastructure um, in place to link all of those platforms into an LRS and then start processing XAPI data. Um, we know that Canvas itself is Caliper, IMS Caliper compliant and that, and it's generating data, but I'm just wondering, um, going forward, do you see, uh, you know, in that situation, do you see um, XAPI being fundamental to 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 uh, proper uh, wiring of all the learning analytics um, across those platforms? What would you what would you say for that situation? I I, I think your situation is exactly the same situation we were in, um, mm. and our solution to that was to decide that it probably will always be a hybrid hmm. in the sense that when you're trying to generate that unit of analysis, um, if you think of the, the LRS data, it's, it's, it's very discrete in nature. It's, it's yeah. episodic, it's, it's serialized, it's, it's not aggregated. Um, yeah. And then in order to generate your unit of analysis, you have to aggregate it. Um, mm -hmm. So unless you're storing aggregated results, you know, uh, across a week, across five week courses, 15 week courses, whatever it happens to be, unless you're storing that in the LRS, there still has to be a process on the outside, uh, an ETL process of some kind um, that it generates that unit of analysis or generates that aggregated uh, result set. 
Um, our, our solution for that was we have, we call it the aggregator, uh, aggravator sometimes. <laughs> um, and its its sole purpose in life is to do exactly that. It, it aggregates the data from multiple data, so, data sources. Uh, we expect that to include the LRS uh, and then uh, helps to generate that unit of analysis and feed it to the predictive engine. So I don't see it. Hmm. I think you're always going to need to do it. And I, I, I don't know enough about X API and how one might go about storing uh, these sort of larger aggregations in an XPI, X API statement. And that's kind of why I'm interested in the committee is, is that's why I'm here is uh, can, can we do that? Do we do that? Should we do that? And, and what's, what's the end result? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a hard answer. Oh. No, that's, that's fine. And then just in terms of the aggregator, is that a platform, a system, uh, an algorithm? It's, it's, a, it's a Linux box uh, that has uh, mostly bash scripts running on it um, that does connectivity, either JDBC, ODBC, or sort of SFTP file transfers from flat sources. Uh, and then we basically convert everything into flat structures uh, and then feed that out. Um, we've, we've fed it out in, um, to a number of different appliances and databases. We've fed it out to MySQL. We've fed it out to an Intesa platform, to a Hadoop platform. Um, we're probably going to feed it out to a Spark platform at this point. Um, so it's really just a Linux box. Well, I shouldn't say just. It's fairly, fairly robust. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's nothing that you can't achieve with open source. And that's okay. And you're, so you're not using the LRS as the sole source of data coming in, like the, all the data comes into the LRS or, or, or LRS is just a part of your ecosystem? It's part of the ecosystem. Um, and and I, I'm not sure how it's going to work out in the long run as far as the, the LRS is concerned. I mean, sort of by definition, it's learning records, but does it really include biographic data? Does it really include data that's not learning based, like, um, you know, uh, well, my example before, uh, dining hall data, as an example, or social media data. Um, those aren't necessarily learning records. So you may find these alternate data sources are always going to exist. Right. right. And I guess that, that's the job of the learning engineer is to really build that infrastructure or, you know, part of their job is to, is to orchestrate or build that infrastructure around uh, uh, all the learning. Yeah, and I think that's the approach we've taken where our, our understanding is it's a migration path. Will it ever be a single source? I, I don't know that answer for sure, but I suspect it never will be. Okay. And I have absolutely no research <laughs> evidence to support yeah. that. Mm, okay. No, so thanks. Ed, yeah. oh, okay, sorry. Um, um, Ed, do you have a list of these um, aggregators that you have been using? I'm sorry, do I have a? The aggregators list that you are using. Uh, the I, aggregator I you mentioned, it's like the, to connect the data, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's just a series of, of programs running on a Linux box, um, mostly written in Python and Bash. Okay, so that you create those aggregators in-house? We, we did, yeah. Okay. And, and those processes are, are not difficult. They're well-defined um, in, in the sense that if you have, uh, I think Dr. Sharma said you, you're using, uh, you didn't say Blackboard, you said Canvas. Um, Canvas is very... That was me. Yeah. Oh, that was you. Um, Sharma yeah. said uh, Moodle. Right. So Moodle, here we use Sakai. Um, but not all the data comes from them. So the processes for sending the data outbound uh, are defined in each of the apps, right? They have their own way of doing it in some cases. So, but it pretty much all cases, you can get a flat file out of it. And that was the approach we took. So SAP just to um, set a data format standard 
for all this data from different sources. Yeah, we think the advantage of the LRS for, for us is going mm -hmm. to be its focus on activity um, mm -hmm. and trying to translate activity into effort. And that's, that's really what, what we're, that's sort of the, what are the, the golden, golden fleece, the golden yeah. nugget, what, what, whatever the right analogy is there. Yeah. So I saw uh, Andy is one of the creators of SAPI. Um, would you like to comment on this, Andy? I'm not sure if he can talk. Andy Johnson. Sorry, I had to unmute. It's, I don't know why this thing mutes by default coming in. Um, yeah, so uh, this, that was a, a great presentation and I appreciate the, the directionality and moving to XAPI. Um, but I'm just curious in terms of, you know, looking at uh, one thing I was worried about is XAPI being used as this panacea that, you know, you just implement it and your all your troubles go away. And that's, mm -hmm. it's not really the case What you, it's just an underlying specification, mm -hmm. um, just like Caliper is. So I guess I'd be curious, you know, are, are these tools that you guys have enabled and I'll, I'll bring in, uh, the other gentleman who is just discussing his particular solution, having a caliper, are, are there not, uh, do you not have interfaces that can bring in data from these streams to do something with them? Because that's eventually what you're going to need is the ability to one, track the data using the, the standard specs or standard you're using, and then two, a way to aggregate it and visualize it. So you, you really need that round trip and while standards enable it, uh, it it's, and, and enable a lot of other good things as well, it, it still is going to be a, a solution that you're gonna to have to approach holistically. Uh, you're right about that mute button. <laughs> um, so sort of taking that in pieces, I think one of the challenges is, is not just looking at the holistic system it's it's a bunch of the legacy stuff that we have to work with that is going to be the challenge of, of plugging it into to the data streams and i'm i'm not well versed enough in lrs's or xapi to know how we're going to do that i know in our sakai instance that it will feed it will feed the lrs directly so that certainly accommodates that it's it's the other pieces that we have floating around that uh, I just don't have a clear picture on, on how it's all going to feed the LRS. And, and I don't know, Andy, maybe you can shed some light on that for us. Well, right. And I think, and that's part of the reason, you know, standards are useful is that if, if one product claims it supports it, then that migration should be easy. Of course, it's always hard then to migrate to the product that will enable it because you still have, if you're trying to enable old data, that's always going to be a, a problem regardless of which direction you take it. I think the, the best you can do is try to mitigate that problem in the future by using standards. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, I mean, a... and then that I'd be curious, you know, as, as you keep progressing down this to, to kind of work with you and, and understand what you're trying to do on a more technical level, um, you know, and I'd be interested in, in kind of taking your journey through this as it as a use case in implementing uh, XAPI and bringing that, you know, capability forward. And if, if you do have Caliper too, I, uh, you know, I'm interested in both sides of this because if there are, if there's value to be generated in both, that could also be an interesting use case. Yeah, the, uh, the one, uh, the student information system, which we use here is Banner, and I'm not sure if they have it. Uh, X API, and that was that's going to be one of our bigger challenges. So does that system have caliper? That or does that not have? Okay, I, I'd, I'd be curious to see a, a solution that combines the two and is able to produce interesting analytics and/or visualizations. And, and on that line, this is Mitch. The uh, concern that I have, you know, representing big government, is that. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, to get to Andy's point about uh, XAPI is a, a becoming a standard and is a specification that you use to make things, that too often 
the terms XAPI and LRS are used interchangeably like those are the same thing and those are two different things. An LRS may be implemented in XAPI, XAPI or may in the future be implemented something else but the thing that, that we need to be cognizant of where I am is that uh, one is the specification that's used to build it and the other is the thing that you're using. So to get back to what uh, Jesse was talking about earlier in the call uh, about uh, AI, a, uh, the difference between an LRS and an LMS is that typically uh, an LMS has a lot more functions in it that are related to keeping track of humongous numbers of learners. We've got like two or three million in ours. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of functions, tasks, that, are, that have been turned into software functions that are in an LMS, no matter which LMS it is, uh, that uh, that are functions that once were performed by humans but are now performed by automation. Uh, so while it's great that we get additional task performance that used to be done by humans uh, out of automation via the use of the uh, XAPI spec or hopefully standard, uh, we have to stay. We have to keep track of what are all the tasks that you need to have done. Getting back to my earlier example. What are all the tasks that need to be done? How, long, how many of them get done in an LRS? How many of them get done in an LMS? Or how many of them get done in something else? Uh, because too often the conversation comes about the neat thing that you want to do, and in my mind, not enough about the cool stuff you're already doing and what happens to that. Or, So, oh, um, Mitch, how do you envision that an SAPI could help with AI implementation? Well, XAPI is a specification, but in my mind, I'll let Andy correct me because he knows more about it than I do. Uh, XAPI is like any other specification, or you know, if you want to extend that example out to to like a programming language. Uh, when I'm, when I'm talking to folks that don't have a deep understanding of this, I explain to them that SCORM and XAPI are both scoring languages because they, un they understand the term language and not so much the term specification. At the, and that those can be implemented on automated systems in order to perform functions. All, all to me, what AI does is You've got, if you're on a continuum, first year in the continuum, and I'll just use live resident instruction, brick and mortar, you got a human standing at the, an instructor standing at the front of the room, and the instructor's responsible for scoring and catching cheating and doing all other sorts of things. And it's very human labor intensive. And in the DOD, uh, there, there's a real move to try to reduce the amount of labor needed for that. So the first step in reducing that human labor was to move uh, live resident instruction to what we call computer aided instruction. So mm -hmm. you still got a classroom, you still got an instructor, you still got a learner, but they're in different places rather than the same place. And you've saved the travel cost of, of moving the learners to the instructor or the instructor to the learners. And, and that's really a big amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've, you're further down the path to CAI and CAI is supported by a course management system which provides the automated means to, to still support a human instructor. You got a drop box, you got a grade book, get all the things the human needs, because the human's still responsible for determining if Joe or Jane got it, uh, did they complete the telos and elos, and did they cheat in collecting the data for item analysis. The next step along that line is computer managed instruction. Mm. There's no instructor, there's no classroom, there's just a learner in a box. Mm. More automation, and, and you get a lot more cost savings on that. But but the, the course software has to pick up scoring, it has to pick up the detection of cheating, it has to pick up the data for the uh, for the training effectiveness analysis and the item analysis to see are, are you asking the right questions. So all AI does, in my view, in the instructional world, is that it may enable some of the places in all, in two of those models, CAI and CMI. Uh, CMSs on for CAI and LMSs, uh, ETSs, uh, electronic testing systems, and uh, learning content management systems for for the CMI. And maybe LRSs for for for, for to, to help out with the LMS load. Uh, it, it enables automated decision making, or you get or it does something and it flags a human. Say in the CAI example, it tells the human, "Hey, come look at this." Or says, "Hey, human." 
Based on the guidance you gave me, I'm saying that these 40 people got the telos and elos and these 20 didn't. And here's where these other 20 need help. And, I, and if, unless you object, I'm going to send them X or Y or Z to help them do that. That's where I see AI assisting instructional uh, system design to, to further automate away certain decisions that humans have to make now. Because there isn't really a lot of, a lot of uh, labor that in the instructional world that, that, that involves real actual uh, psychomotor labor. Most of it's uh, giving it a present, presenting instruction and grading instruction, maybe mentoring or something. But, but uh, our, our instructors aren't out making the desks. They aren't out building the chairs. They aren't out building the buildings. So, so there's a smaller amount of occupational space for AI to take over. Just my two cents worth over. <laughs> yeah. So, um, have you like? But, but oh, just, go ahead. just put XAPI all in that. I would just say that Mitch is right. Uh, you know, to to some degree, different uh, proprietors, or I guess, or, or pushers of ADI of AI would argue for more autonomy in it and less decision making by humans, depending mm -hmm. on what spectrum you fall on. But really, all XAPI does is allows data points for that AI to make decisions on, um, yeah. standardizing the input to that AI, because it's likely going to have a lot of different areas it's pulling from. But having a standard way to bring that in is going yeah. to let AI systems um, converse with other types of systems and converse with each other more easily. Yeah. Yeah, true. That's it. Um, to build a seamless intelligent learning environment across applications. Part of the one of the problems we have is large data holes um, from basically the different learning environments where people aren't using the LMS or mm -hmm. they're not using automated tools where we can capture the data. So uh, I'm kind of interested in. Well, I am very interested in uh, how we how we fill those gaps, how we impute that data. If we impute that data, what do we? How does that affect our predictions? And I think I, I don't think XAPI or LRSs help us with that at all. Or uh, that's well, my. I can give you an actual use case where we automated our way into a hole in the army. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have what 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 I call the largest LMS in the world. Uh, it's called the Army Learning Management System. It's about 12 systems cobbled together, and, and, and it runs on a scale almost unimaginable. Uh, and, and we automated in a lot, of, a lot of unique capabilities into it. And one of them, two of them are called the Recertification Attributes Capability, or we just call it the RAC. Uh, and, and the other is called, uh, well, I forget what the name is, but it has, it has to do with... Uh, giving the learner credit for stuff the learner has already taken. And, and these two things, I got to explain how they work to, to get to the problem. So what the RAC does, if you've got a class, it, uh, a course, and it's got 10 parts, what the RAC does, it allows the instructional designer to say, uh, for each one of those 10 parts, this knowledge has a date stamp of a year, six months, two years, and independently. So when the learner's six months or year is up, the system automatically prompts to learn, hey, you need to come back and, and take this or I'm going to invalidate you for the whole course. And that's the rack. The, the thing that supports it, uh, the name which escapes me, uh, it, uh, if we've got, so, so that first course had 10 parts. Now you've got two courses next to it that each have 10 parts. So that's 30 parts. However, some number of those parts are shared among the courses. So in the second course and the third course, five of each of those parts are shared with the first course. So when Joe goes to take the second course after they've completed the first course, Joe automatically gets credit for the five he's, he's already taken. And if via some combination of courses, Joe has taken all 10 parts for the second course and other courses, and they're all still current according to the RAC, as soon as Joe registers, he gets a completion certificate saying, you done good. And the system keeps track of all that. And, and uh, so, to, to make this work, it has to send a lot of automated notices to Joe. Uh, uh, even when the course itself expires, say it's an annual requirement like mandatory training, don't stub your toe training or something. Every year, Joe gets a notice when his window opens and the window is set in the rack, how many days before it expires, how many days after, and 
what and what and what we do to escalate the notices for Joe that has to take this again. Uh, so Joe gets all these notices, but what happened and that worked great. Particularly if we've got courses that two million people have to take a year, and we've got like fifteen of those. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, in the army, we, we couldn't we couldn't guess what was going to happen with policy. And the same thing may happen with, with some of the stuff we're talking about. So the policy changed in the Army. So commanders out in units could, rather than have their, their person go online and take the course in the ALMS, he could assemble, he or she could assemble all their people in a theater and say, don't stub your toe. And they would theoretically get credit for it in one system called DTMS. But unless that credit got returned back to the ALMS, Joe was still getting these notices. You haven't taken this. You haven't taken this. Joe has taken it, but it was recorded in a different course. I'm not saying that, that this same exact problem will crop up, but any time that you introduce varied systems together and you connect them with connectors, which mm -hmm. is a, a lot of what we're talking about here, we're, we're connecting one system to another via connectors. And as you control all of the systems that are being connected, Right after you turn it on, within some number of days after you turn it on, somebody's going to change one of those connections. And you'll discover, like we did, that you've got engineers spending a lot of time doing nothing other than turning down the connectors and trying to figure out what, what went wrong. And that's just a use case of something to think about. And, th and that was one of the attractions, if, you, if, you, if you're an old enough engineer, of an all-in-one system, uh, and, which is basically what an LMS says. It's every typically everything in one, then we do a lot of connections to ours. You had everything in one system, so you didn't have to worry about the system fighting with itself. But the more you shrink each system, connect them to other systems, mm -hmm. the more likely it is that, th that your control over those other systems is going to, isn't there. And you'll, you'll spend a lot of time just trying to figure out what went wrong. And I know it took a while to explain that, and I apologize, but, but I have to explain it every now and again. People go, well, how did this happen? I said, you guys did it because you changed the systems. Well, Mitch, I, I've been around a little while. I was uh, a, a lab assistant in the Academic Automation Division Office of the Dean at West Point in 1977. So that was a little little while back. And it's, it's the guys at West Point that, that I'm going to this meeting with about uh, about uh, the military and the icicle. Oh. And, and, and they, are having, they are having conniption fits over the over the. Uh, the lack of, inter, uh, of, of connectivity between DTMS, which records the live training, and ALMS. And it's, it's literally driving the whole army nuts. Well, I live just on the other side of the mountain, so if you're up in West Point, let me know. I will. Okay. Um, we have had a great conversation here, and Thank you all for the extra time you stay with us. And um, thank you, Ed. You're very welcome. Thanks all.